Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. As we approach the holidays, many people begin to feel depression setting on as they realize that lost family members, relationships breaking up, or maybe things just not working out for them just make them feel depressed. Well, on the program today, we're going to be taking a look at some ways that we can actually take a look at how we can come to understand what depression is and how people can perhaps move out of this naturally and effectively. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is a guest who spent more than 40 years of research and based on his paradoxical idea that your negative thoughts and feelings are not the result of some defect like a chemical imbalance in your brain or a, quote, mental disorder, but from what is most beautiful and awesome about you and your core values. The moment that you realize this, recovery will be just a stone's throw away. We'll also learn why depression and anxiety, the world's oldest cons, crush the ten types of distorted thoughts that rob you of happiness and self-esteem as well as more. And in addition to this, with the academic research, our guest has written a number of books on this, and his best-selling book, Feeling Good, The New Mood Therapy, has sold more than 4 million copies in the United States and many more worldwide. And this book is also most frequently prescribed for depressed patients by psychiatrists and psychologists in the United States and Canada. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Dr. David Burns. David, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Thanks, Daniel. I'm really uh, honored and excited to be on your show. Well, I feel good that I feel honored <laughs> and so <laughs> forth. You know, That's what you were talking about is these core values. And I think what's unique about this paradoxical idea is that we are inherently born as soul, you know, as a light. And I think that as we come into this world, we get conditioned down to believe that that's not true. And I think that's the kind of conflict internally that I believe a lot of people have. And that's what causes depression, the confusion. What are your thoughts on this based on your research? Well, I, I, I think there's an awful lot of truth in what you're saying. The, I, you know, I was trained as a psychiatrist, and most mental health professionals are trained pretty much the same way to see depression as a mental disorder or anxiety as a mental disorder. You can buy a copy of the DSM-5 that the American Psychiatric Association puts out. You can find hundreds of so-called mental mental disorders. You know, if you're if you, if you tend to worry about things, then you, you you're diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. If you're feel awkward in social situations, you're diagnosed with a social anxiety disorder. And if you're prone to depression, you may be told you have a major depressive disorder or or dysthymic disorder, which is chronic chronic depression and the problem with looking at it in that way it makes it seem like you're broken and defective and and so you have to go to therapy to be fixed or to get up you know to become a little less less abnormal and it's just uh, not a very happy method me- message it's it, it's kind of demoralizing and 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 what I've done in my my work at at Stanford in the last uh, 15 years is developed some tremendous new treatments for depression. The book you mentioned, Feeling Good, was the book I published in 1980, and it was uh, very helpful for people who were depressed and and still is. But uh, in my work at Stanford, I've created even newer techniques based on this idea that your depression and anxiety are not the result of what's wrong with you, but what's right with, with you. And I can, I can give some examples of that. But the, the moment the patient sees that or the individual sees that, all of a sudden you're not so ashamed and, and feeling broken and, and, and defective. And it has a, a, an immediate mood-elevating effect. And then when I go in and help the patient crush the distorted thoughts that cause depression and anxiety, it's, it's really easy. And so, you know, when I wrote Feeling Good uh, in 1980, that was a revolution in the history of uh, psychotherapy. And, and we saw that depression could be treated without drugs and often as little as, uh, you know, 8, 10, 12 sessions as opposed to years of talk therapy. 
now with the new techniques, and, and I have a new book called just came out called Feeling Great that has all the new techniques. We're seeing people recover from depression now, uh, typically in just a single session. Uh, it has to be a two-hour session, but it's it's kind of like more of a, a one-and-done thing because the new techniques are so are so powerful. And I think this is good news to anyone who's who struggled with the feeling like you're not good enough or worrying all the time or beating up on yourself with with a lot of uh, self-critical thoughts. Depression and anxiety can be cured or helped tr- tremendously pretty quickly now uh, and and usually without having to take medications or get involved in lengthy therapy. Because I also know, too, when it comes to depression medication, it's uh, pretty heavy-duty stuff and has probably long-term effects on the brain and the person's uh, physicality that are pretty negative, aren't they? Well, they, you know, they, they, they can be. They, in terms of the new antidepressants are so powerful, they, they glom onto brain receptors with in, intensely, and so when you try to get off of them, there there can be all kinds of uh, rebound effects and, and and withdrawal effects that can be pretty uh, unpleasant. And but you know one one thing I I tend to not to want to say because it fires up a lot of controversy. But the you, you know anything has a placebo effect. If you, if you took a sugar pill and you thought it was an antidepressant, you know the, a third of the people would would get better just for, from that. And recent researchers have gone into the Food and Drug Administration and looked at all the data that drug companies have submitted to try to get drugs like Prozac or Effexor or, you know, any of the so-called antidepressants approved as antidepressants. And uh, Irving Kirsch from uh, Harvard has reanalyzed all of that data, written a book about it, and his his analysis concluded that the drugs called antidepressants really aren't antidepressants. They have few or no true antidepressant properties above and beyond their their placebo of, uh, effects. Th- th- what they do do is they, they cause a doubling or tripling of suicidal urges as well as uh, completed suicides, but they're, they, they don't seem to outcompete placebos in uh, the treatment of, of depression itself. And I started out as a full doing full-time research on brain chemistry and and doing full-time psychopharmacology and I've prescribed antidepressants 13,000 occasions. I haven't in the last 25 years, but in the early days I did thinking if somebody wanted it, you know, I better give it to them or it could be a, have legal ramifications because everyone was so convinced that the antidepressants were the necessary treatment for depression, but I I never saw much from them, and that's why I developed uh, powerful drug-free techniques. And now, you know, I, I I don't see much much role for the chemicals called antidepressants. If something's helping someone, you know, God bless you, uh, stick stick with it, and, and that and that's terrific. But uh, I just think it's uh, exciting when I sit down with someone, I can see them re- recover very very quickly now with with the new techniques without having to to get involved in in medications. Yeah, I ha- I wanted to bring that up because as uh, I was opening the show I immediately thought of the time when Tom Cruise was on the Today show and he got into a fiery heated exchange with Matt Lauer. Yeah, and the way I they had presented that. that in the media versus when you actually go uh, like I seen it on YouTube probably say 3 or 4 years ago. And I actually watched the exchange. I thought, well, Tom Cruise was right. Yeah, <laughs> and, that's and what I, I thought too. Yeah, yeah I, and I, I say, think... yeah, I was going to say I say this because I've been in media for well, you know, we're talking twenty years, and a couple of things that I've done a lot of neat research and study, and is the idea of how propaganda was you know created and how it works, subliminal persuasion, messaging, and advertising. Sure. And he was simply saying, look, you know, you brought Brooke Shields on here, and she's waving around how she was having, what, postpartum depression, and she took this particular prescription, and it helped her. You guys came on and basically gave her a blessing for this, and the problem with that that I have is you don't know the long-term effects of the psychotropic drugs that you're alleging are okay for people to go out there and use. Yeah. And it was so powerful, I thought, geez, you know, the media didn't present that. They made it sound like he was tearing him a new one, which he actually was, because he says, 
you people in the media are being tremendously irresponsible. What were your thoughts about that? Well, I, I thought he, he was making good points also. I think part of the reason it came under such negative cr- criticism is uh, I think he was connected with... Uh, yeah, it's the Scientology argument. Oh, yeah, I get Scientology, right. which mm-hmm. is perhaps uh, criticized sometimes for, for for good for good reason. Sure. But just because uh, you, you know somebody you don't like is saying something, it doesn't mean it's wrong. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 there are certain conditions that are true brain disorders, like schizophrenia, where where people are hallucinating and. Hearing voices, that's a tragic disorder. I've treated many people with schizophrenia, and it's, it, sometimes medications are needed at a certain point in the treatment of schizophrenia. Uh, and, and hopefully one day we'll know the cause. It's some disorder of brain tissue. The, the cause isn't yet known. It's just, it, it's just a very sad, sad kind of d- disorder. And then if you have bipolar 1, where you get extraordinarily euphoric and psychotic and you know, driving your car 100 miles an hour down uh, down the freeway, and you don't need sleep, and you get very, very grandiose. That too sometimes needs treatment with uh, lithium or some other mood mood stabilizer. So there there is a place for medications. I've never been a, against medications. I'm only against medications that that don't work. And also, uh, I, I'm all for healing people, cure, curing people. And, and I just think it's it's neat that for, you know, the vast majority of people suffering from depression or panic attacks or obsessive compulsive disorder, or worrying or phobias or you know, whatever public speaking anxiety, shyness, whatever is bugging you, there, there are just fantastic new techniques to, to, to treat those conditions, even with, with your own, you know, picking up feeling good or feeling great and, and using these new techniques. Uh, you know, in many cases, there, there's research just on my original book, Feeling Good, that if you hand that book to someone who's severely depressed, uh, 50 to 75 percent of those, or 50 to 65 percent of those people will be symptom free in four weeks without any without any treatment. And but people don't know this because no one's promoting my book. The drug companies are making billions, so they keep promoting these the, these drugs, and people think, oh gosh, I must I, I must need a drug. We had some work d- done on our house. Uh, and uh, it needed some, uh, it's an older house, and we needed some painting work, and there was some uh, wood that ha- had to be replaced, and there was this fellow, and you just call him, I think I, in my book, Feeling Great, he's in the introductions, I think I called him Frank to disguise his identity, but he was really a nice guy, and uh, and he just did such beautiful work and on, on the house, it was over several weeks, and on the last day, I was walking downstairs into our entry hall, and and he was kneeling there. The door was open, and he was doing some last bit of work on on, on something at the entrance to the door. And I sensed he was uh, kind of in a negative mood, or he seemed sad. And uh, and and I, I was about to tell him how grateful my wife and I were for the fabulous work he did to make our house more beautiful. We were just so much appreciating it. And, and he looked up to me and, 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 and he says, I, uh, uh, and I, I thanked him for the, the great work, and, and, and then, but he looked real humble and, and very sad. And he was on his knees and he, he said, I heard, I heard, Doc, that, that maybe you're a doctor or something like that. And... I don't know if I'm depressed or whatever, but I, I've been feeling really, really down, and I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe I need a medication. Uh, so I thought I'd ask you. And, and I said, well, gosh, you're feeling down. And, you know, the whole idea behind cognitive therapy in my book, book first book, Feeling feeling Good, is that your thoughts create your moods. It's what you're telling yourself. And I said, what what are you telling yourself? What are the What are you thinking when... When you're feeling down, and and he says, well, you know, I, I uh, started painting houses when I got out of high school. I never went to college or anything, and I've been doing that my whole life. And uh, now I'm getting older, and you know, my body I won't be able to keep up with this for so much longer. And 
telling myself that that maybe I I won't have enough money to re- retire and to support my wife and when I'm looking back on my life I'm I'm asking myself what did I ever accomplish that amounted to anything because all I all I did was just paint houses and his tears were just going down his cheeks and I I just felt so sad can I ask you a quick question on him yeah. uh, about how old was he when you were having this conversation well he must have been like you know 60 or 65 sure. or, yeah. or something something mm-hmm. in, in in that range and uh and that, and that I, I I said to him, well, well, Frank or whatever I'm calling him in the in the book, what how, what would there, there's a little technique I'd like to try uh, with you if you if you don't mind. It's called the double standard technique. Because a lot of us we have a double standard. We we beat up on ourselves. We're real mean to ourselves, and and yet we'd be very kind to someone else. Suppose there was another fellow here exactly your age. He he looks like you. He, his life has been just like yours, and he, he's telling you the, these things, saying, I, my, I never amounted to anything, and I won't be able to retire, and stuff like that. Would would, would you say something like that, that to a dear friend? He, would say, he said, yeah, if he was just like me, I, I'd say those things to him, of course. I said, okay, we'll say them to him right now. Just imagine there's a fellow just like you, and just tell him, tell him right now. Just say your your life never amounted to anything. You're not going to have enough money to retire on. You're at the end of the road. Say that out loud. And then he said, "Oh, Doc, I could never say that to someone." And I said, "Why not?" And he says, "Because it would be so cruel. Because because it it kind of isn't even true." I said, okay, what would you say to him? I, I said, I, I would tell him, you can be proud. You can be damn proud. You've done beautiful work for people, and they have loved your work, just like the Burnses here have, have are loving your work. And, and you have never overcharged. You've given great quality work. You've made people happy throughout your entire life. And you do have a retirement fund, and you will have uh, enough to, to retire on. And although you're not you know, as strong and as you and vital as you used to be, you you're still doing good work and even if you you know, do some part time work that that'll be that'll be good enough and uh you know that you can celebrate your retirement. You can celebrate your life. And I say, would that be true of a friend who was just like you? He says, Absolutely that's true. And I said, Well then maybe that's true of you too because this friend is just like you. Would you be willing to talk to yourself like that? That he saw it. It's like a light bulb went off in his head. And he says, oh, you mean it's the problem is the way I'm thinking and talking to myself? I said, that's right. The problem isn't that you're at the end of your life or anything like that. The problem is this mean way you've been talking to, to yourself. And that's something you can change right now. And you don't need pills to, to, to do that. And he says, Doc, God bless you. He says, I, "I just my depression just disappeared, and I'm just feel, feeling joy, and that that just made me, man, that that made my day. That that type of thing makes makes my week, my month. Uh, that, that that that's what I I live for, and uh, it's the most beautiful thing in the world to to be able to give someone who's suffering the gift of joy, and to be able to do it quickly." And, and without some long treatment or, or having to take pills. Sometimes pills are life-saving, so I'm never against medications uh, if, if, they're, if they're important and necessary. But I just, you know, it's the holiday time, and there's, there's no greater gift uh, in the world uh, than, than the gift of happiness. Absolutely agree with that. I was as I was listening to you too. I was thinking, are you familiar with uh, the work of Byron Katie? I've maybe heard the name, but I'm a real slow reader, so I don't. I'm not familiar <laughs> well, she's with She's been much out of actually. Yeah, she's been out actually for a long time, and mm-hmm. she does this thing called an inquiry. And uh, she wrote a book. Uh, it was called uh, "Loving What Is: Four Questions That'll Change Your Life." And, oh. Going on the same premise, you know, she found herself, I think it was like at the age of 38, just curled up on the floor 
much like I'm sure you've encountered this through your work over the years, you know, dark curtains pulled, just feeling, you know, life just wasn't really worth getting up every day and living for. <clears throat> oh, wow. And all of a sudden, she just sort of had this light go on, much like what you're talking about here in this, uh, uh, when you were dealing with this painter here. And she began to question her thoughts. <clears throat> and so, like, for instance, when somebody would have, let's say, a troubling thought, oh, man, I ain't ever going to amount to nothing. The first question would be, well, is this true? Yeah. You sure. know, and then you go through this four question. And the four question inquiry can kind of take variations, but basically she gets to the point, when did you first have this thought, and where do you feel this thought in your body kind of a thing? Mm -hmm. Now, what was fascinating, and we actually had her on the program several years ago, is people get these aha insights, much like what your work does, to where they realize, you know, I thought my way into this situation. And how many times have we heard that from, say, self-help gurus? You know, your thinking, your best thinking has gotten you where you are. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. I remember, uh, who was it, uh, uh, with Aerosmith, uh, Taylor, Stephen Taylor was talking about as he beat alcoholism, that his doctor told him, your best thinking is what got you here. Oh, but yeah. what I loved about Byron Katie's work is she started with me, what had happened is I started having this automatic thought that would block a negative thought, like, you know, Daniel, you're such an idiot. You know, and then what I, what happened was from her is I would have this other thought immediately come in. What evidence do you have that that's true? Just that simple change in my thinking got me laughing about it. <laughs> you yeah, know what I've I mean? seen that too. And at, at the moment of recovery, often people go into uncontrollable laughter when they see the absurdity of the things <laughs> they've been, been telling yourselves. The Buddhists had right. a name for that called laughing enlightenment. It's one of the forms right. of enlightenment. But it sure is fun to laugh. And when I do therapy, there's there's a lot of, a lot of laughter. A, a colleague came to me recently for treatment, and on my Feeling Good podcast, I do live therapy, uh, and, and, and so people can hear the new type of therapy that we've developed and how, how rapidly it can work, but some people don't, don't believe that it's your thoughts that, that create your, your moods, and uh, they say, well, if, some, if something real happens, you know, it's the event, it's not your thoughts. Like if you have find out you have terminal cancer, that that event is causing you to be to be depressed, not your sure. thinking. Mm -hmm. And a colleague came to me, uh, and uh, a dear colleague, she's been a friend for, for years, and she went to the doctor for a routine medical checkup and. He said, "I think I, I need to take an, a chest X-ray," and and uh, and then he he did some other tests and, and said, "You've got stage four lung cancer." And she was just devastated, horribly depressed, intensely anxious, enraged, angry, guilty, ashamed, everything as severe as you can imagine. So I treated her on a one of my Feeling Good podcasts live, and. Uh, with commentary on, on how it works. And again, she recovered completely in one session. It was a, it was a two-hour session. I, I can't do it in one hour. I think this one hour a week with the thing with people, it, it, you know, it doesn't make much sense to me. But Well, yeah, because you think of all the hours from that point forward until the next session that you have a chance to reroute the condition that got you yeah. there in the first place. <laughs> yeah, and forget what you did. How many hours is that? It's quite a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. But at any rate, she recovered completely, and more, she re really went into a state of euphoria. But when I went back and listened to that session, a third of the time we were giggling and laughing. You think, oh, that's so disrespectful to be laughing when someone finds out they've got uh, terminal terminal cancer. But it, 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 it was... An incredibly enjoyable, you know, process, and her thoughts were just so distorted. It was these distorted messages. It wasn't the cancer; it was the way she was thinking about it, and what she was telling herself. Like, little like Bill, gee, I've never found a loving partner in my life, so I'm a failure as a human being, and and I've had a struggle with alcoholism. She's very active in the uh, AA community, by by the way. But because of my alcoholism, I'm 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 bad, and 
and uh, and I'm not religious enough, uh, and and I'm, I'm losing my belief in God and my belief in the afterlife, and and just beating beating up on herself. It was exactly the same as as with the uh, with the house house painter, when you know I helped her to see the illogic in what she was telling herself, and 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 the and the cruelty in it, and as as she began to to, to see this, uh, it, it you know her. Her negative feelings just just vanished. It was such a, a tremendous feeling to be able to give her that, you know. And I, I can't give her the gift of making a cancer go away, but I can certainly give her the gift of, of feeling uh, joy, feeling uh, loved, feeling lovable, feel, feeling worthwhile. And that that that's the greatest thing in in the world. That and also uh, that she uh, allows herself to feel worthy of being loved. And, you know, yeah. there's a, a powerful thing to look in in and of itself is the idea that we have come or become conditioned. And certainly with, you know, you're, you're approaching probably half a century in your work and research. So that's a long time you've been out there doing what you're doing and producing the books that you have. But that a lot of us have that feeling of being undeserving and to yeah. give you an example, you know, when you go and gift somebody, well, for instance, just recently I, I bought a friend of mine a Starbucks coffee, and she wanted to offer me money, and this was like the second time in a row that I did this, and she goes, well, I don't want you to think that you have to do this. And I looked at her, and I said, I do it because I enjoy it. But I could tell, and I feel that they feel undeserving. Why do I get this gift unconditionally? And a great example of that is many years ago when I was in hospitality, there was a gentleman who was the maitre d' and as well as the manager, <clears throat> and he was constantly expressing how great I was and I'm doing this and this. And at first, I, I, I liked hearing it at first, but after a while, as it got so consistent, it began to make me feel uncomfortable. Like, yeah. well, I'm not that great. And I knew with the internal thinking, but I actually had the internal tools, if you will, that kind of allowed me to say, okay, well, wait a minute, why can't I accept this gift that he's giving me and live up to this? You know, much like what a coach would do on a, on a basketball or football field sure. or whatever. And I thought, why not? You know, I deserve because this is who I really want to be, right? So my question to you in all these years you've been in this, what do you think is probably the most common field of observation that causes so many of us to feel that we're undeserving, you know, things like that. What are are we receiving messages and conditioning since we were little that creates this? Well, uh, yeah, there, and, and we don't know if these messages are inherited genetically or learned from society or, or a combination. But they're in in my in my books, feeling good, and also in in the new one, feeling great. I talk about you know certain self defeating beliefs that can lead to depression and anxiety and also sometimes relationship problems but uh, you know a very common one that I'm sure a lot of listeners can identify with this is per perfectionism uh, you know th thinking that you know if, if we're not knocking it out of the park it's it, it it's no good at all or uh, you know uh, perceived perfectionism is a term I coined that's the idea that others won't love or accept you unless you impress them in some way or you have to earn their love uh, and then there's there's the achievement addiction like my worth as a human being depends on my uh, achievements and then and we start beating up on ourselves because we we think oh well gosh I've never achieved anything special uh, I had a patient who had a home in in Gladwin Pennsylvania when I was in 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 uh, uh, living in Philadelphia, we're out in California now. Uh, but uh, she, she was uh, depressed, and and Gladwin is a very wealthy area uh, outside of Philadelphia. But she had moved in, she and her husband, before it became a, a fancy place, and so they had a, a nice house. But you know, they 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 weren't high flying financially, and by any means and she said dr burns you know uh, how, how could i could be be worthwhile uh I, i've never achieved anything special when i was in high school i wasn't one of the valedictorian or you know captain of you know some team or 
one of the popular people. I, I was just just average, and 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 then when I go to the super fresh grocery store, I see all these women, and you know our house is surrounded by mansions, and and they've got uh, you know fancy uh, Mercedes or. Uh, and they're wearing beautiful clothing and uh, fancy fancy jewelry, and many of them are e- executives of, of, you know, earning tremendous salaries. And how how could how could I ever be happy? And I, I'm not not like that. I don't have any of those things. And and that and that's you know the kind of messages we we kind of pick up from society and from TV that you know you have to be special to be happy and worthwhile. And so we spend our lives beating up on ourselves because we're not good enough and comparing ourselves to, to others and, 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 and thinking that, that we're not good enough. And if somehow we could achieve this ideal view of ourself, we, we'd, we'd have, 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 have happiness. And that pursuit actually doesn't lead to happiness. It leads, to, in many cases, to depression. Uh, in some cases, I, I, I'm aware of, to to suicide, uh, right. thinking you know I, I'm I'm not earning enough money to to really be wor- worthwhile. One thing that helped me a great deal uh, is is that uh, my I used to be a dog person, and then our, our 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 dog died, and my wife converted me to to cats. I used to hate cats because they're so independent and narcissistic, and they threaten my narcissism. <laughs> but, but she kind of, she kind of taught me. Shame on those cats for feeling so positive about themselves. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> There's exactly. no low self-esteem there, is there? <laughs> yeah, no, no, exactly. And, and so, but uh, she kind of converted me and taught me how, how to really love cats, and 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 this uh, violent feral cat came to our back door in fact my new book feeling great is is dedicated to to him and he used to get uh, come in our yard he he lived in the woods behind our house and and tyrannize our our kitties and i chased him out of the yard on many occasions and he came to our kitchen door which is a glass door and he was terrified of me and i said why would he come to the glass door and then he looked at me, caught my eye, and he held, held his right paw up, and it was as big as his head. Wow. And I could see some horrible thing had happened to him, and I saw that he was emaciated, like a concentration camp victim, uh, and something had happened to his foot, and he couldn't hunt, and he was on the verge of death. And out of desperation, he came to our back door. And my wife and I captured him and brought him to the vet, and they did surgery and found a puncture wound and said he had to be indoors and with antibiotics for a week to survive. We put him in our guest room, and he tore it apart. He peed all over the carpets. We couldn't get close to him. He hissed. He tried to bite us if we tried to get close to, to him. He pooed in the in the vents in the floor, the heating vents. But after that week, uh, we let him out. He went out like a rocket ship to get out of the house. But then he started coming back and coming back. I said, I wonder if he wants us to adopt him. And and we started opening the door and feeding him right inside the door so he'd have to come in to get food. And little by little, he, he, he became, you know, a, a, almost like a house cat. And, and he slept in our bed, and he came to love me, and he loved our other cats. And I loved him more than than life itself, really. He became my best friend. And being with Obi was the greatest experience of of my life. Uh, It was beyond words, the joy I had when I was with him. And and I used to think, you know, there's nothing special about Obi. He's just a predator cat who's, who's turned super nice. But... He won't win any cat shows. He's covered with scars and from fights. When he came to us, he had worms and fleas and ticks. And 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 I'm pretty old. You know, I'm not special. I, I screw up all the time. Uh, I, I used to run pretty at an average speed. And now when I go out and do my running, uh, elderly women with hobbling on canes fly right past me i'm so slow people think i'm walking when i think i'm jogging but i'm not special anymore and obi wasn't special but being with him he taught me that when you no longer need to be special life becomes special right and 
that's the death of the self, the death of the of, of the pride, and and that's that's the key uh, to to overcoming depression and anxiety. And of course, saying it won't help people because they still think, oh well, I I know I'm not good enough, I know I'm no good, I know I'm a loser, I know I'm hopeless. But that, that he he taught me so much, and you know some sometimes the Buddhists say uh, when when the student is ready, a teacher will appear. And uh, Obi was one of my best teachers and best friends, and sadly, but he was feral, so every night he had to go out from four to six to do his hunting. And he'd come back at six and scratch on our bedroom door, and I'd get up and open it, and he'd come out and jump up back on the bed and, and, and get on my chest, and he, he would sleep on my chest every night. And then one morning at six, my wife said he... He didn't. He's not here at the door, and I knew instantly that that he'd been killed. There was a mountain lion behind her, behind our house, and I was always worried the mountain lion would get him, and and so we we we, we lost him. And but I love him so much, and and I, I I learned so much from him that's been helpful to me personally, and and you know the the message has been so helpful. To, to many of my patients, but we don't want to accept our averageness or our below averageness, right. we, you know, because society says, oh, experience the thrill of perfection with the new Lexus, you mm-hmm. know, and when you see that, I've got to be perfect, I've, I've got to be be more than than I am, and, and so we beat up on ourselves uh, because of this or, or, or that flaw. Now, I, I love that story. That's really a unique story, and I love the way this cat shows up that, as you said, is battle-hardened, scarred. Uh, This is a a wonderful animal that came into this world, I think, like the rest of us, but into conditions that reaffirm either, A, you're going to become special or you won't. It's one way or the other, maybe down the middle. And, And you don't have that choice in that environment that you come into, but we all know that inherently... We're hardwired for choices once we can unlock that. And the biggest thing that I was uh, going to take away from the story that leads into, uh, I think, a really important question is that of self-esteem. Now, I think that's a catchphrase. Uh, first of all, I kind of waver about the reality of this. And the reason is, is I remember years ago I was hearing an interview uh, that involved the Dalai Lama. And the question was asked by someone in the audience, what is the best way to elevate or remove negative self-esteem? And so as the translator was translating the question, there was this confused look that came over the Dalai Lama. Apparently, he didn't know what self-esteem really was. He'd never heard of it before. And so when it was explained to him, he all of a sudden laughed, and this was his response. You Westerners find the most creative ways to create suffering. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Yeah, yeah. So much wisdom there. But, you um, know, the idea of the self, you know, we want to identify, first of all, how wild it is. I, I think about this since I was a little kid, like how wild it is to be alive, to look out through my eyes and go, I'm aware. It's just, a, I, I was one of those weird kids, I guess. And the idea of self that you that you are unique, which you are. You know, we all are unique, but how you apply that uniqueness into the world. But I think self esteem got twisted into something else more weaponized against our psyche. Yeah. I wanna get your feelings or thoughts on this. Well I love what you're saying, uh and, and again it's it's something that once you understand it it makes per- perfect sense and if you're suffering it it's it's hard to under understand but in my first book, Feeling Good, I talked about the, the different paths to self-esteem. And, and, you know, the first is conditional self-esteem, where they, they try to make children in school feel special, saying, oh, you have special eyes, or you have a beautiful singing voice, and that this makes you worth worthwhile. And, and, and the trouble with, with conditional self-esteem is, is that, well, what happens when, when you get hoarse or when you lose your vision or you know when when you're when you find out your singing voice is, isn't going to get a career for you or or, or something like like that uh, and, and 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 so the next step up the rung is called unconditional self esteem and that that's where you love and accept yourself 
just because you're a human being. For example, if your child fell and skinned his knee or her knee and came to you in tears or had been belittled by other children and came feeling ashamed and cheerful, you would hug and love your child because the child needs your love, not because he or she has earned it in some way by having a good singing voice or an A in arithmetic or, or something like that. And so unconditional self-esteem is, is where you, you simply make the decision to treat yourself in a loving way, in a kindly way, just because you're, you're a human being. And that, that's the next step up the ladder. And then the next step up the ladder is, is where you suddenly discover that unconditional self-esteem is just another perfectionistic trap. Uh, as the Dalai Lama was, was saying, another kind of another way. Well, why should you have to have unconditional self-esteem? Right. And so the ones you've got unconditional self-esteem, I say now get rid of it as fast as you can because it's just a pain in the butt and it's a, a total waste of time. I lost my self-esteem one day in Philadelphia. I used to jog back and forth from the train station uh, to get a little extra exercise. And one day on the way home from the train station, uh, while I was jogging, my, my self-esteem just fell off while I was jogging. And I thought, oh, what a relief. I'm so glad I got rid of that thing. <laughs> and I started jogging a little faster. And then a few steps later, my self fell off. I thought, oh, man, that is, that's even better. And I got, I got rid of myself. So I don't have a self anymore, and I don't have self-esteem anymore. And it's been uh, one of the greatest uh, developments in my life. Unfortunately, every now and then my self comes back to life or my self-esteem comes back to life and then I suffer again. But yeah. that's, that's <laughs> another thing I learned from Obi. You know, mm -hmm. he, what he wanted was to go outside and for me to walk around the neighborhood so he would follow me because he wanted all the neighbors to see that we were together and that he was my cat and that he had a home. And 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 I practically cry just just thinking about that. And and every, whenever he wanted to do that, I always did that. And we spent a lot of time doing that, and it was great. And we didn't need any self-esteem. It would have been just a total a total waste of time. You know, once you get rid of yourself, you get rid of your self-esteem. It's the Buddha called it the great death. That's what the Buddhist, that's probably what the Dalai Lama would say, it's, it's the great death. But the great death is actually the great rebirth. It's a celebration of, of, of life because when yourself has died, you're, you're suddenly free, free to love, to be loved, to, 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 have, to have joy. But I, this probably sounds like psychobabble and meaningless to a lot of the listeners who don't get it. In the new book, Feeling Great, I've got chapters on, on the idea that you know, yourself can't be judged by, by other people. Uh, right. And, and, and to, get, to get freedom from this idea that we have to measure something about ourselves, and, and the measurement has to be at such and such, such a level to be happy. And, and real joy, real happiness comes from, from, from being alive to, to, to doing things that you, that you love doing, to be with people you, you care about, and not from you know, being special or impressing anyone, anyone that you're, that you're special. When I give talks uh, to mental health professionals, workshops, what they value the most is when I talk about, you know, failures that I've had or times that I was feeling down and how I got out of that. But to, to, when I show my, my humanness, that, that that's what they really like. I mean, you have to have good stuff to teach, but if, you know, in the old days when I was trying to impress people, eh, sometimes I could pull it off a little bit, and sometimes it didn't work so good. But I, I, I it's just been a discovery to me that people aren't looking for perfection in, in in me. They're looking for me to be warm and caring and human and open and vulnerable. And what I treat mental health professionals as, as part of their, their training, and they, they open up, and I have a free training group at Stanford Medical School every week for community therapists. They can come and get unlimited free psychotherapy training and unlimited free psychotherapy as well, because uh, all the mental health professionals are 
anxious and insecure, uh, at least all the ones I've ever known. I know, I've come to understand it was something that I had heard just recently within, let's say, the last couple of months, and it was really funny because uh, what he had said is most people in the industry are actually trying to work through their own stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's ab- absolutely true. And then once they've worked it through, you know, that, then they have far more power and effectiveness at, at healing others because then you can say to your patients, you know, you're, you, you say you had a terrible childhood and you feel defective. Uh, and I know how painful that is, one of the worst feelings in the world. And to uh, tell you the truth, I've been there myself, and I know how awful that is, and, and I can show you the way out of the woods as well. And that's what people want to hear. They want to hear that you're human, but also that you're a professional and you've got the, the magic to, to help them change their lives. And here's another thing, too, David, that I thought would be a great thing to bring bring up, too, as this is let's say, as we've talked about here in the last 10 minutes or so, about how we have been messaged and conditioned in, in ways from uh, we'll just call it media or entertainment that somehow when you're this, then you will have arrived. That's yeah. sort of keeping up with the Joneses. And I think why it's important to bring that up is to simply realize that if this is true, let's say that right now, anyone listening out there, uh, they're not feeling so good about themselves. Then I would say, okay, who out there in the world that you know of that say on the main stage and regardless of what it is um, that you most admire? And if so, are you willing to go and if it's available, find a biography on this person? And if you're willing to do that, you can find a good objective biography. You will realize all these people that we've exalted and put up on pedestals have suffered and taken hits that, are you sure that's the life you really want? <laughs> because yeah. it's pretty rough stuff out there, you know, yeah. when you take a look at who these people are and what they've done. And, you know, the losses, the gains, I'm sure the frustrations, all that, and that's just life. And it's learning to have the right tools to help you navigate, A, through these things, but to grow and realize you're making your tools stronger. What I love for instance, about in Japan, their practice of Zen is the idea of spending each waking day toward mastery. Now, that's not perfection. Mastery mm-hmm. is a much different thing, and it's oh, a beautiful okay. thing. Why don't we go ahead and touch on that just a bit here? Yeah, well, you you, you take the lead here or, or ask a question or something like that. Well, I was just going to say because the idea of mastery is you realize you can feel yourself elev- elevating through the work that it takes. So let's go ahead, for instance. Now, I know in your book you talk about reframing of a negative thought. Why don't we go ahead and start there? Yeah, well, they, one of the new developments in in psychotherapy in the last 10 or 15 years is that to help people see that, that, that when you're struggling and, and feeling depressed and, and anxious and guilty and, and ashamed and so forth, it's, it's not because there's something wrong with you. It's because, there's, it's because of what's most beautiful about you and your, your core values. To take a, a, a real simple example, uh, I, I often treat people in my uh, workshops, public workshops, treat people live in front of the audience so they can see that what I'm saying is true and and, and see how this, this new uh, treatment actually works. But I was working with a woman who uh, I actually described in one of the chapters of, of Feeling Great, my new book. Her name is Karen, and her problem that she wanted treatment for in front of a, a live workshop I was doing in the San, San Francisco was that her daughter had been shot in the face when her daughter was was uh, 12, 12 years old. She said, Mommy, can I go out and play? And Karen said, yeah, it, that, that's okay. Just make sure you bring your coat. Because she'd gone out to play after dinner every night for, for years. And then some neighborhood boys snuck up on her daughter with a high-powered pellet rifle and uh, shot her in the face from a foot away. Wow. And it, the bullet hit a tooth, which exploded, and, and there was a lot of uh, damage to, to her mouth and face. And she ran inside with 
blood gushing out of her mouth and screaming and uh, this this led to nine years of uh, surgeries and treatment for her daughter's post-traumatic stress disorder. And at the time, Karen asked for for, for, for treatment in front of the audience. Her, her daughter was still, you know, su- suffering pretty severely. But Karen was beating up on herself, uh, saying, "It's my fault. I never 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 should have let her go out and play." Uh, her childhood was ruined be- because of uh, of me, and she was also telling herself probably the people in the audience who are watching me are judging me and, and thinking I'm, I'm a failure as a mother uh, as well. And before I could attack those distorted and unfair thoughts, those messages she was giving herself, that that's the cause of her depression and, and her her anxiety. Uh, and and I, I I do this thing called a positive reframing. It's a tool people can use, learn to use on their own if if interested. But I, I you know, after I empathized, I said, Karen, what if a miracle happens here today? What what miracle would you be hoping for? And she said, Well, I've been suffering for nine years. I pray to God every day, and nothing happens. And and I've just been extraordinarily depressed, anxious. I feel defective, guilty, ashamed, angry, hopeless, uh, and 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 if those feelings could go away, that that would be the miracle. She said, "I don't think it's possible, but that's the miracle." And I said, "Well, let's say we have a magic button here, and if you press it, you'll instantly go into a state of euphoria with no effort, and all your negative thoughts and feelings will disappear." Would you press it? And and like everyone, she says, "Oh, I press it in a heartbeat." Then I said, "Well, yeah, we." We have no magic button, but I certainly have magical techniques, and perhaps we could bring that result about, but, but I don't think we should. I'm not convinced we should. And she said, well, why not, Dr. Burns? If if you've got the tools to, to help end my depression, please, I'll do anything if you'll show me those tools. And I said, well, before we do it, let's see what these negative thoughts and feelings show about you that's positive and awesome. I said, let's start with depression. You're you're 90 out of 100 on the depression scale. If you press the magic button, you'll be happy. Is that what you want? You want to be happy and euphoric about the fact that your daughter's still suffering? She says, oh, no, that sounds terrible. And I says, so what does your depression show about that show about you that's beautiful and awesome? It says, well, it's the expression of my love for my daughter. I said, absolutely. And and you're also very self-critical. You're beating up on yourself all the time. What does that show about you that's positive and awesome? And she says, well, maybe it shows that I have high standards. I said, do you have high standards? She says, absolutely. I say, have they been helpful to you? She says, Ab- absolutely. Uh, I said, well, that's, that's a good thing. If you press the magic button, you see all your high standards will go down the drain as well as your depression and your anxiety. And, you know, what's great about your anxiety? You're worrying constantly. She says, well, my worrying is is my love for my daughter as well because I want to protect her. I don't want something bad to to happen to her. And we went on and on showing all the beautiful things her negative thoughts and feelings showed about her. Her her feeling of inadequacy and effectiveness showed that she was realistic and honest because she has many defects. We all do. And it also shows she's accountable She's saying the buck stops here. I'm going to look inwardly for errors I might have made or I might be making rather than blaming the the world. And she was a very religious person, and and all of her self-criticisms and and shame and guilt showed her humility. And she's a a very humble person, and her anger shows that she's like a mama bear fighting to protect her cubs because she has a right to be angry. Those parents never should have let those boys go out and play with a loaded rifle with other children, and on and on. And so we, we came up with, with a list of 20 things that her negative thoughts and feelings showed about her. Her guilt also, saying, I'm a bad mother, that shows what a good mother she is, because she's constantly doing everything to try to protect and, and help her, her daughter. And, uh, and, and, and then... At the end, I said, well, gosh, maybe you don't want to press that magic button because then all these beautiful things about you are going to disappear. Your, your depression, your anxiety, it's not due to a chemical imbalance in your brain. It's due to your love of your daughter and all these beautiful things about you. 
And then I said, maybe we could just tune them down a little, turn them, uh, dial them down a little, rather than making them disappear. How how depressed would you want to be? You don't want your depression to go to zero. If you could dial it down, what would be the ideal amount? He said, oh, 10%. And I said, can I sell you on 20%? You only want to be 10%? And she says, yeah, that, that, that's enough depression. And she wanted to be 5% ashamed. She wanted her shame to go from 100 to 5 and, you know, different numbers on the different ones. And that, that's how we melt away the resistance because now she suddenly sees that her symptoms are an expression of what's beautiful about her, not what's broken about her. And at that point, it was easy for her to blow away all of, all of these negative thoughts instead of telling herself, I never should have let her go out and play. She said, I could tell myself I couldn't predict the future. I had no idea she was about to get shot. If I'd known it, I would have told her, wait 10 minutes, dear, before you go out and play, because if you go out now, you'll be shot. So wait a few minutes. But she said, I, I, couldn't, I can't predict the future. There's no way it's my fault that, that she got shot. And then I said, yeah, and, and maybe you could how could you test this thought you have? You know, you're talking, Daniel, about getting the evidence. I said, you, you say the people in the audience are judging you. How could you find out if that's true? So I suppose I could ask him. I said, do you want to do that? She says, oh, no, I'm terrified. I said, that's a good reason for doing it. Why don't you do it? She was scared to tremendously. And so she said, well, could maybe some of you come up and take the microphone and tell me if you're judging me, tell me what you think about me. And then a whole line of people suddenly ran up to the microphone and one by one they took the microphone and she said, are you judging me? Do you think I'm a bad mother? And every one of them had tears going down their cheeks and said, Karen, you're my hero. I can't imagine a more loving mother. And Karen could not believe what she was hearing time after time. And every time they said it, she just sobbed in joy. She couldn't believe that the people weren't really judging her. And then at the end of the session, her all of her feelings went to zero. She went really into a state of euphoria. She, she said a lot of her, her feelings were below zero. In other words, not only did the depression disappear, but she was feeling really ecstasy and uh, it was just such a wonderful thing. But that, that, that's kind of how that, how that works, to, to, to see that your suffering is an expression of something beautiful about you. But it's not a formula. It has to, each person has to see that for themselves. And it's different for, for each person, the, the insight, the aha moment. But it's, right. it's, it's a powerful new tool for fighting depression and anxiety. I'm reminded so much as you say this and tell this story of uh, years ago when I was uh, with the public broadcasting network, PBS. And so we'd get a lot of books and things like that in, and it was fun. And I ended up getting uh, shipped to me the series that was called the Love Trilogy Series, in which a statement was posed and then, say, thought leaders of the world, like people such as Marianne Williamson, Tony Robbins, things like that, uh, Deepak Chopra would all respond, you know, with their insights to whatever the statement was. And there was uh, one particular one that struck me, and I keep attributing it to Dr. Bernie Siegel, who we had on the program many years ago. And he had simply stated, in relation to what we're talking about here, the negative thinking that we have on ourselves, the fact that we think we're screw-ups, things like that, is he simply says, let's just go ahead and look at this in this context. In billions of years of universal evolution, you know, just think about that. Billions of years of this going on, nobody can screw up quite like you can. <laughs> yeah. And I thought yeah. the genius in that. You get yeah. to actually look at the bad stuff and say, you know, nobody does it as good as I do. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Not that you want to take that in too far of a direction, but... You know, sure. it's kind of a warm way to look at it. So sure, was that fun being in public broadcasting and getting books all the time? And well, of course it was because you know you finally started for me. You know, I started as a volunteer, mm -hmm. and I think that's something we could probably touch on with the few minutes that we have left. Is 
Sometimes I think a great way maybe to pull yourself out of a depression is see how you can take what you have and serve someone else, you know, but, you know, without going too crazy about that. Hey, look at me. I made a difference in your life. That's not the way we're thinking. In fact, there's a Buddhist precept that simply says, if you plan on giving a gift, do it in such a way that no one knows where it came from. Yeah, and that's right. a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> yeah, right. They, um, I, I love what you're saying. I love volunteer work. I'm on the volunteer faculty at the Stanford Medical School. I'm not paid for my teaching, but I just I do it because I love doing it. And sure. I haven't uh, charged anyone for therapy in 25 years. I kind of have the idea that the best things in life are free. So, uh, but but yeah, there's there's something very joyous for me because when I'm I'm working with someone they they can't think oh you know he's in it for the money or something like like that and the only reward for me is to see somebody change and and to go from despair to to joy and that that is a fantastic a fantastic re- re- reward and and you know I'm I'm sad that uh, the, number one, the quality of, of psychotherapy and psychiatric care, to my way of thinking, in the United States, isn't very good, and a lot of people can't afford therapy. They they can't, uh, and if they can afford it, they they can't find a therapist who can you know heal them or cure them, and uh, and and so that that's why I, I, I write my books. They're, they're not. Free. My website has all kinds of stuff that's free, though. All the Feeling Good podcasts on my website, mm-hmm. feelinggood.com, and are I've free. Been, and I'm on that now, and I'll tell yeah. folks, you know, just your blog alone, there's a lot of wonderful stuff on there, Thank you know, you. for yeah. people to take a look at. So, And there's free classes, too, if you're depressed. There's a class, a de- free depression class. There's a free class on anxiety disorders. But... Uh, yeah, I don't even know what I was babbling about there. but uh, Well, we were talking about volunteerism and yeah. why that can be so uh, yeah. evident in helping people heal is that yeah. you're reaching out with who you are. But the other thing, too, to point out, too, is the fact that when you begin this journey, this takes work. You know, oh, yeah. once you yeah, have the tools, you don't pick up a hammer and start swinging it thinking you're going to build a house. Yeah. It takes time. but. Once that happens, a, a most amazing thing happens is now that you have this inside of you, you're able to reach out and help others when the time presents itself. You don't go out and be a fanatic and go out there and grab everybody you think is broken and say, hey, guess what? You know, you yeah. allow these things to come into your world because now those opportunities, I think, become your teachers. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah, the the work is important. The uh, uh, when I was in private practice in in, in Philadelphia, uh, I did research on what accounts for recovery, and and one of the things that we found was that uh, you know I use psychotherapy homework uh, as a part of the treatment, and I, I did a paper that I published in the top psychology research journal uh, that uh, that showed that. Uh, Pretty much every patient who did at least some consistent psychotherapy homework between sessions uh, improved dramatically or recovered in the first 12 weeks of treatment. In contrast, practically every patient who refused to do the psychotherapy homework not only failed to improve, but they deteriorated and typically just drop, dropped out of out of the therapy. The homework was things like writing down your negative thoughts, <clears throat> identifying the distortions in them from the list of distortions in, in my first book, Feeling Good, uh, and then writing down more positive <clears throat> thoughts to, ch- to challenge those, those, those negative messages. And uh, everyone who, who put out that effort benefited uh, tr- tremendously. So you're absolutely right that, that, that there's, there's work, there's definitely work, work involved, but it's a joyous work because it takes you out of despair and takes you in, in, into happiness. Absolutely. Well, Dr. David Burns, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to be on our program here today discussing your book, Feeling Great. Uh, Why don't you go ahead and give out your website where people can discover your work, your blog, how they can get the book, things like that. Sure. It's easy to remember just the the name of my first book, .com, feelinggood.com, feeling good is one word with two Gs in the middle, .com, and then 
once you get to the website, there's tremendous things there uh, that you can click on, uh, like the, the, you can click on the, the Feeling Good podcast tab, and we've got now over 200 podcasts. We, we just had our three millionth download. Wow. And, and there's a search function, so if you have a particular problem like obsessive compulsive disorder, you can type that in, and then you'll come to multiple podcasts on that, including one with a woman named Sarah who recovered from more than 20 years of severe OCD in just three minutes. Wow. Um, one night at my Tuesday group at Stanford, mm-hmm. and there's a little video. You can see her uh, at the exact mo- moment of, of her re- recovery, or if you have social anxiety or shyness, uh, you know, we've had some of our most popular podcasts have been curing people with severe uh, so, social anxiety. But there, there's a lot of, you know, free self, self-help there. Almost everything on the website is, is, is free. Well, fantastic. And uh, God must be blessing you if you got the URL feelinggood.com. I mean, how yeah, much better does I it get it, than that? Yeah, I, thought I, I think I got it in the early days before everyone was going after these things. And yeah. then, well, I got a book by that name, and yeah. then I got a, a, a URL with that name. And, uh, yeah, it's been a good one. Yeah, and the newest book, Feeling Great. I want to thank you again for being on the program today. This has been a wonderful discussion. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Daniel, and good luck in your ongoing work and pursuits. It's just, you're fantastic. Same same to you, my friend. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You can discover more at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. That is our website where you can discover our weekly e-newsletter. We encourage you to sign up for it, which will keep you up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50, as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 radio program. And remember, wherever you are is where you should be. Have a great day. 